All right, so thank you for coming today, everybody. This is our fourth of seven discussions on the topic of international trade in the 21st century. So uh, to paraphrase General MacArthur, we are continuing to show that uh, old Department of Commerce staffers never die. They just come lecture at the Dole Institute. Uh, but in all seriousness, I am really excited to have my friend Atman Trivedi here with me today. Atman uh, worked, I worked with Atman when he was the Senior Director for Policy and Global Markets at the U.S. Department of Commerce. And really, today's discussion could not be more timely. For better or worse, trade continues to be a topic that dominates our national conversation. If you went to the New York Times homepage this morning, you would have seen two articles at the top of the homepage. One titled, Trade Deficit Soars to Record Level, and another titled, U.S. and E.U. are headed for a food fight over trade. And if you looked at the Washington Post, the first two articles you would have seen this morning are titled, U.S. Trade Deficit in Goods Grew to a Record $891.2 Billion, and another article titled, From $22 an Hour to $11 an Hour, GM Job Cuts Show the hot US economy is still leaving parts of the country behind. So we've talked about the history of trade, we've talked about our recent turn towards protectionism, and we talked last week with Jordan Haas about how Congress has looked at several of the most recent big trade-related issues that have come before it. The Trans-Pacific Partnership, Trade Promotion Authority, and currently the US-Mexico-Canada Trade Agreement. So, all of this has us really well positioned for today's conversation. We are almost 26 months into the Trump administration, so it's a perfect time to take a closer look at how this administration thinks about trade, the policy decisions it's made, and what have been the results of those decisions. But before we jump into the conversation, I want to run through our remaining sessions. So just a reminder that we'll take off next week for spring break. Uh, then we'll come back on March 20th, and we're going to have a really interesting discussion with Mike Matson from the Kansas Farm Bureau. And he's going to talk to us about how trade impacts us right here in Kansas. On March 27th, I'm really excited for this session, we're going to have Megan Grube, who is the former director of speech writing at the U.S. Department of Commerce. And she's going to talk about how messaging and how pro and anti-free trade messages have helped shape public opinion on the issue. And then finally, we're going to wrap up the discussion group on April 3rd. We're going to talk with Paul Piquato, the former Assistant Secretary for Enforcement and Compliance at the U.S. Department of Commerce. So I want to now introduce Atman and get right to our conversation, and we'll be sure to leave plenty of time for your questions. So Atman has over 20 years of high-level policy, legal, and communications experience across foreign affairs, trade, and defense policy. And the thing that I think is so remarkable about Atman and his career is that he's wrestled with these issues from so many different vantage points, including think tanks, private legal practice, as a staffer in the U.S. Senate, at the U.S. Department of State, and at the U.S. Department of Commerce, and now as managing director at an international consultancy. Early in his career, Atman worked as a national security analyst at SAIC, and as a junior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. After law school, Ottman worked as an international trade lawyer at the law firm of Wilmer Hale. He then went to work on Capitol Hill as defense policy counsel for then Senator John Kerry before moving to the professional staff of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, where he was chief advisor to then Senate Foreign Relations Committee chairman John Kerry on India and Southeast Asia. In 2012, when, Secretary, when Senator Kerry became Secretary Kerry and was tapped to run the U.S. State Department, Ottman became Chief of Staff in the State Department's International Security and Nonproliferation Bureau. In November 2014, Ottman started at the U.S. Department of Commerce as the Senior Director for Policy in Global Markets. He is currently a Managing Director at Hills & Company, an international consulting firm that helps businesses expand trade and investment worldwide. Ottman holds a BA in International Relations from Stanford, an MA in International Policy Studies from Stanford, and a law degree from Columbia Law School. It's, it's not that often that we have a guest who went to every one of my safety schools. <laughs> uh, so please join me in welcoming Ottman Trevetti to the Dole Institute.
So uh, before we talk about the Trump administration's trade policies, I want to just talk to you a little bit about your background and career path. I mean, as I noted in the introduction, how, how you've touched these international issues from so many different angles. And you majored in international relations, so you've obviously had this interest for a long time. What, what do you think was it drew you to international work and international issues? Well, first of all, thanks, Ethan, for having me here and to the Dole Institute and to all of you for uh, taking time out of your busy schedules to uh, talk trade with us. Um, you know, I, I grew up uh, uh, in Texas, and uh, my family came here as immigrants. My dad came uh, in the late 1960s. He was an engineer in uh, Mississippi State um, uh, and, and did his graduate studies there. And, um, you know, he used to watch the evening news when he got home uh, with Walter Cronkite at the time, the CBS Evening News. And so, you know, he would watch it, and I would sit beside him, and I didn't really know what was going on at five or six or whatever. But, you know, he was into it, so I kind of got into it, you know, some... You know, some, some dads are like Jayhawk football fans. Some, <laughs> some, some dads, you know, are, are news junkies. Um, and, um, you know, and so that's how I got interested and realized there was a world out there at large. And then I did stuff in high school like Model UN and happened to grow up in a very ethnically diverse neighborhood outside of Houston where a lot of immigrants uh, just kind of came to migrate there. And, uh, you know, so I was always interested about the world around me. So we've got some, some students and some young people here today. What, what would be your advice for students who are interested in pursuing careers with an international angle to them? It's, it's such a fun time to be a student, I think, in, in today's world. I mean, you all are familiar with the cliches about the world, you know, having shrunk and you know, globalization making us all interconnected. But, I mean, you can now go and study abroad. Uh, you can come and study in Washington. Um, you know, and, and there's just a, a real richness of opportunities out there that, that weren't there back when uh, Ethan and I were uh, in school. Um, you know, I, I think understanding history is important, you know, because... It has a way of repeating itself. And, um, you know, in our democracy, every time we have a new elected leader, um, either in the White House or in the Congress, you know, we, we, ca we tend to kind of repeat mistakes sometimes. And, you know, so I think understanding history is important. Uh, learning languages, um, you know, uh, learning about other cultures out there. and. Um, you know, taking advantage of uh, uh, overseas study opportunities, I think, are all, um, you know, things uh, to think about. And so, talk about some of the similarities and differences, and I guess what you've learned at each of the different kinds of organizations. I mean, how do you think that, uh, you know, like, what is the role of, of think tanks versus, you know, actually being in government? How would you compare and contrast that? And talk about that a little bit. Sure. You know... When you're in government, you're kind of in a bubble. It's, it's hard to get information sometimes. You're running, in the executive branch in particular, you're running from one meeting to another, trying to get things done. So when you're out of government, that's the time to really kind of pack your intellectual bags, if you will. You know, you really want to, you know, do the reading, you know, the, the kind of thinking that's a luxury, you know. You'll remember from... Uh, our time in government, you know, yeah. it's, um, you're just often stuck in the moment and you don't have the luxury to think things through in a careful way. And I, that's what think tanks and, you know, institutes like this one, you know, are about, you know, being able to think about broader issues and take a step back, look at history, um, you know, and, and, um, Figure out what you th what you think about the world, so that you're not doing it on the fly um, when you're in the White House or in Congress. Um, I'm, I'm curious that you you know you've worked as both a senior staffer in the Senate and also as a senior official in the executive branch. 
how do you compare, they're both government jobs, but how do you compare working on the Hill versus working uh, in the executive branch? Yeah, they're, they're both really different, uh, you know, in terms of the atmospherics, in terms of the day-to-day. -day. Um, you know, the, the Congress's job in part is to do oversight of the executive branch. That's constitutionally one of its responsibilities. So it holds hearings, um, it tries to legislate and pass laws. Um, uh, you know, it, it, the, in the foreign relations realm, uh, members make trips to do fact finding. Uh, in the executive branch, you're trying to get stuff done. You're executing on those laws. And um, you remember, Ethan, I mean, it's, it's hard when you're trying to, you know, get, get even the most modest things done, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and uh, so the day-to-day -day of diplomacy, you know, you're grinding from meeting to meetings, um, incrementally trying to move the ball forward. Meanwhile, Congress kind of sets the mood music. The Congress is the broader context in which the executive branch uh, tries to implement policy. You know, you, you'll hear every night on the news what Speaker Pelosi or, uh, you know, uh, what, what uh, Senator McConnell was saying. Uh, you know, they kind of set the overall atmospherics and the mood. Um, and in the, the foreign affairs world and in the trade world, they have an important role, not only in terms of legislating, in terms of sanctions and, you know, passing laws, but in terms of doing oversight, including, you know, as we'll talk about on trade agreements. Mm -hmm. it, you know, your position now is as in managing director at an international consultancy. That's something that a lot of folks may not even know really exists or, or know exactly what they do. And obviously, we don't want you to talk about specific clients or matters, but just talk about generally about kind of the work that your firm does, why somebody would engage your firm, and, and what, what shops like that do and, and what their value, value add is. Yeah, we're, the, the international strategy consulting space is kind of a Washington, D.C. animal. Um, when uh, people come out of government, uh, you know, uh, they're still very excited and interested in policy and what's happening in the world. Uh, but the demands of the real world come in. And uh, you know, I, I came out of the Obama administration. And then you have to, you have to find a, a real job. And uh, you know, the closest thing I could do to what I was doing with Ethan at Commerce was uh, consulting with US companies who have problems overseas in foreign markets. And so uh, a lot of us consultants are uh, uh, rehabilitated government employees, uh, work, worked at Commerce or State or USTR uh, on the Hill. And we try to use that experience and what we learned about diplomacy, about talking to foreign governments, about how our government works, uh, to advise companies. And so they'll often look for help on trying to tackle a foreign problem uh, in a market like China or India. Uh, can you help us uh, get this antitrust clearance with Beijing? Uh, or, you know, how should we tackle this problem with Mexico, you know, where the leader has said something and, you know, now we need to try to uh, get him to reverse what he said publicly and approve this license that we need. Uh, so basically, it's, it's tackling problems with foreign governments using the skills um, that hopefully we, we picked up uh, in, in government. I, I agree. Growing up is, is really a pain. Uh, so you know, the focus of today's discussion is the Trump administration's trade policy. And uh, so I want to really cover three sort of big things. What is their philosophy? How are they looking at this? As a result of that philosophy, what are some of the major decisions they've made? And then what have been the results of those decisions? And, and since we're talking about the administration's philosophy on trade policy, and just to show you that the world really does all revolve around the Dole Institute, it, it's worth noting that Robert Lighthizer, the current US trade representative, worked for Senator Dole from 1978 to 1983. 
and for part of that time was Senator Dole's chief of staff on the Senate Finance Committee. And Senator Dole actually testified on Ambassador Light in Ambassador Lighthouser's support during his confirmation hearings. So sort of a, a interesting uh, anecdote before we dive in. But so how would you describe this administration's overarching views on trade and what are the big ideas that it has about trade? You know, this administration's views on trade are, are very disruptive when you compare them to um, you know, the, the 60, 70 years of U US trade policy post-World War II. Disruptive in the sense that, you know, I think in general there's been this kind of a continuity, particularly I'd say in the last 25 years ago, where there's generally support for open markets, open borders, uh, trying to do trade agreements uh, to pry open other markets that uh, may have tariff and non-tariff barriers uh, that um, we don't have here in, in the US. But I think Trump came in to office uh, in 2016. He obviously campaigned on something different. Um, his basic bargain, his contract with the American people, I think, is that the status quo is broken uh, and that it, it needs to be disruptive, that the international trading system um, is fundamentally unfair, that it privileges um, elites on the two coasts, um, and that uh, we need to get back to, to, to being tougher when we negotiate trade agreements. And uh, what we need to do is, um, you know, first renegotiate the bad trade deals uh, in the view of this administration uh, that uh, previous administrations signed up to. And um, we got to do it bilaterally. You know, the, the World Trade Organization uh, uh, isn't a fair system. And, uh, you know, Trump campaigned on uh, concerns about how China has uh, used the international trading system in, in his view to uh, its benefit. And uh, not only to China's benefit, but to the ex expense of the American worker. Uh, and so I think Trump has come in and tried to uh, redo deals. And we've seen that uh, with uh, NAFTA 2.0, um, uh, with uh, the US-South Korea FTA that was renegotiated, and you know, most prominently with the withdrawal of uh, from TPP, uh, in, 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 uh, that was one of his earliest decisions uh, in the Oval Office. So this is a very, very different approach to trade. Uh, but I, I think we may be in a different political moment. And uh, you, know, you were telling me, Ethan, how in the last session uh, that you held, uh, you know, that you talked about how it doesn't break cleanly up along party lines anymore. Really, it's about you know uh, people who believe in open systems and and people who support more closed systems, and you know the Trump and his supporters, America First, as well as people on on uh, the, the the left, um, you know I think there's uh, there's not that much of a difference necessarily between uh, in substance, maybe not in optics and you know emotional atmospherics, but between, say, a, a Sanders approach to trade and a, a Trump approach to trade. Yeah. I think Sanders' approach would be less tariff heavy, certainly, but the diagnosis may be pretty similar. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I think is so interesting about President Trump and trade is that, you know, this is somebody who's had, I think it's fair to say, a variety of different views on a variety of different issues, has been a member of many different political parties over his lifetime. And, uh, but one of the things that has been a real theme throughout all of his public statements, even going back as, as long as 1987, and it's interesting, you can Google it, and I would actually encourage people to look at this. In 1987, the president uh, paid $87,000 and took out an op-ed, a letter to the American people, in the Boston Globe, the Washington Post, and the New York Times. And he articulates the exact same views that he holds today. If you substitute the word China for the word Japan, he's essentially making the exact same argument. So this is, when we talk about philosophy, I do think it's important for folks to understand this is a deeply held 
belief of the president. This is something that he really feels, has felt for decades, that the system's unfair to workers, it's unfair to, to Americans, it puts the U.S. at disadvantage, we're being taken advantage by other, other countries. It's not something that he came to in 2016, it didn't hit him like a bolt of lightning. This is a deep, deep held belief of the, of the president. Um, one thing you touch on, and, and I was working on this on, and peripherally when I was leaving the administration during the transition period, was this preference for bilateral deals. Because we heard that a lot at, when I was at Commerce during the end about this new administration was going to come in. We were not doing these big multi-party deals like the Trans-Pacific Partnership or the Transatlantic Trade Investment Partnership. We were just going to sit down one-on-one -on -one and crank out bilateral deals with different countries. What, what is in their mind, what is kind of the, the philosophical appeal of a bilateral deal compared to a multilateral? It's, it's an interesting question. And, you know, you're totally right about the president, by the way. I mean, he's had the same views on trade now since the 1980s or earlier. If you go to the art of the deal, uh, you will find that he has always supported a very kind of maximalist, tough, you know, approach on trade and negotiating bilaterally. And what it's about is, hey, we are the world's strongest economy still. And uh, the size of our markets, and everybody wants access to our, our markets, you know, gives us a certain leverage. And it's easier as the big kid on the block to, to deal with the little kids if you pick them off one by one, uh, rather than have them all come at you together. You know, I mean, in international relations, you'll often hear uh, about analogies to Gulliver, the U.S. being Gulliver, and the Lilliputians. Well, you know, Gulliver is much better off if he's, you know, dealing with Lil the Lilliputians one by one, rather than be being tied down by various international rules, like, you know, the World Trade Organization and, and the Trans-Pacific Partnership that mm -hmm. you and I uh, uh, labored on with others. Um, but there's this sense that I can get more leverage and I can, I can twist your arm better if it's just you and I across the table versus the U.S. power gets diluted when it's us and a number of other countries. It, it, do, do parts of that ring true or what would you say are there, is, is that the right way to look at it or, or are there benefits to multilateral agreements that that point of view may be missing? I don't think it's the right way to look at, look at it. I mean, I would suggest, first of all, it, it reflects a certain uh, lack of generosity of spirit that I think has characterized uh, America since World War II. Um, you know, the way China negotiates, like, you know, there's a disagreement in Asia over a bunch of rocks in the South China and East China Sea. And the way the Chinese like to negotiate is one on one. They don't want, you know, the various claimants. There's, you know, a half dozen claimants in the South China Sea coming at China all at once. But we're fundamentally different. You know, our conception of ourselves is a little bit different. I mean, to make it a little bit more concrete and uh, bring this down to the real world, um, multilateral deals make it easier for businesses and consumers to sell and buy products overseas. I mean, if you got one set of rules that you got to learn versus a bunch of different rules, which is going to be easier for you as, as a small business? And keep in mind, most exporters, well over 95% of the exporters in America are actually small businesses. So I think multilateral deals are, are the way to go. And it's also become clear from you know, 26 months of observing the administration that they are just fixated on this idea of bilateral trade deficits. And I want to note that the Department of Commerce, our old colleagues, put out a report today that said that last year the U.S. posted an $891.2 billion trade deficit in goods, which is the largest in our country's history. Our trade jet gap with China is a record $419 billion. But going back, is that the right lens to be looking at? I mean, we hear just endless 
commentary from the president and from his advisors about this bilateral trade deficit and how it needs to, to be uh, shrunk, is, is that the right metric? Is that the right way to look at it? Well, if you talk to economists, even, the, you'll be hard-pressed hard to find one mainstream respected economist who thinks that trade deficits are a good way to evaluate the overall health of an economic relationship with another country. You know, trade deficits reflect things that have nothing to do with fairness in large part. You know, they have more to do with a country's patterns of consumption, uh, savings, and investment. You know, I run a, d a deficit with my supermarket and my dry cleaner. At work, I better run a surplus, you know. Um, but that's, that doesn't mean the fact that I run a deficit with my dry cleaner doesn't mean that I'm somehow being treated unfairly. Mm -hmm. That's just the patterns of trade. And you were talking about, you know, the, the trade deficit uh, news that's come out, you know, uh, today. And, that again has, has nothing to do necessarily with fairness. The trade deficit being so high reflects the fact that the American economy is growing. And it's growing faster than that of other countries. And so while the rest of the world is slowing down, we've actually experienced you know, reasonably good growth over the last few years. You know, I think part of that is a sugar high, parenthetically, that has to do with tax cuts that are going to wear off pretty soon. But because we're doing well, we're buying more, and we're importing more from other countries. Because other countries aren't doing well as well, they're buying a little bit less. Does that necessarily mean there's some sort of unfairness in play? Not necessarily. Right. Um. So I want to talk now about sort of the three big, uh, big sort of things that I think really uh, exemplify the, the, this philosophy that we've talked about. Um, but before we do that, I want to ask you a question about tariffs. I mean, this administration is, looks at tariffs fundamentally differently than the way that previous Republican administrations and, and previous Democratic administrations have looked at it. And Trump said on Saturday that tariffs and import taxes are his quote was, the greatest negotiating tool in the history of our country. Uh, can you describe kind of first their view on tariffs and then the pros and cons of, of that view? You know, I, I think the administration's view of trade is, is, you know, might makes right. And as, you know, the, the world's strongest economic power still, there's a sense that, um, if we make it more difficult for other countries uh, to uh, sell into the U.S. market uh, with all the wealth that we have as a country, um, that that is, uh, that's going to be something that leads other countries to rethink their unfair trade practices. Um, and so if you put a 10% tariff for 15 or 20, 25% tariff on products, um, you know, I think the president thinks money is flowing into the U.S. Treasury. The thing about tariffs is the person who, who pays the tariff is typically the importer of record. Generally, you know, that's going to be, you know, a, a, a freight forwarder or somebody who's importing the product. It could be the company that's importing the product. But in short, it's, it's the, the U.S. side that's bearing the cost. And it's fundamentally the U.S. consumer who sees it in the purchases. Because typically businesses will have to pass those costs on uh, to other people. And um, so tariffs come with a cost. I mean, you all might have seen there was a study that came out earlier this week. The New York Federal Reserve, Princeton, and Columbia economists all got together. And they looked at the trade war, you know, last year. And what they found out is coming towards the end of, the, of last year, every month the trade war was costing us $1.8 billion, that's a billion with a B, in real income. Um, so, you know, there, 
you know, tra trade wars aren't, aren't easy, and they're picking winners, and more often than not, they lead to adverse economic outcomes. Yeah. And I think that same study also showed that 100% of the tariffs were being, the cost was being borne by American consumers. Uh, so let's talk now about, and sort of go right into the, the tariff question. So we've seen that exemplified on the tariffs that the president imposed on steel, aluminum, solar panels, and washing machines. Talk about that decision and then how other countries responded to that. You know, the president got elected, you know, during the campaign he was out there on the trail um, talking about bringing jobs back for steel workers, uh, bringing blue collar manufacturing jobs back. And so I think, you know, the administration feels like it's making good on a promise when it decided to impose tariffs on steel and aluminum. Um, and that was, the president could say, hey, this is a promise kept. Um, now, the justification that the president used um, is, is one that hasn't, has been rarely used uh, as a matter of trade policy. You know, uh, national security, uh, tariffs being imposed on national security grounds. Um, the idea be, being that steel and aluminum is of course used uh, by the Pentagon in uh, military items and weapons and that we have to make sure we have self-sufficiency. So we're gonna discourage imports coming from other parts of the world. The only problem with that is that um, it, it's not like we have a shortage of steel here in America. You know, that's not the issue, uh, one. Two, we get most of the steel from military allies, you know, our friends. So all of a sudden, these friends who have fought wars with us side by side over the last century, you know, are a national security threat. I mean, I, I don't know about you guys, but I don't see the Canadians as, you know, <laughs> a, a, a real national security threat. They don't keep me up at night. Yeah. Or the Aussies. <laughs> or, um, but so that's, that's what the president has, has done. You know, and he's used other trade tools, you know, with washer machines. And, but the idea is that we're going to keep these jobs in America. The only problem with that is that empirically history shows us that when you do things like you try to uh, protect the steel industry like George uh, W. Bush did in the early 2000s, that actually led to a sizable net loss of American jobs. The, the government is just not really good at picking winners and losers. Uh, and I say that as a progressive. Um, you know, but we're not good at picking uh, winners and losers, and that's what tariffs end up doing. It's a very heavy-handed government intervention, and it, you know, the law of unintended consequences is fully in effect, particularly in an age of uh, globalization and global supply chains. So, so what, what's sort of the tail of the tape? So on, on, the tariffs were announced on March 8th, so literally almost a year ago today. And at that time, President Trump tweeted that trade wars are good and easy to win, which you, you'd referenced. Yeah. So, so one year in, how does that statement look? You know, I, I think it doesn't look too, so great. Um, you know, there's nothing easy about trade wars once you escalate. Uh, it's hard to figure out how you de-escalate. Um, you know, there are going to be downstream effects that um, you didn't account for. Like, um, you know, take the China uh, the trade tariffs. They've really hurt our farmers. Yeah, so talk yeah. about how folks have responded to the tariffs, how other countries yeah. have responded yeah. to the tariffs. Well, you know, a, a tariff that's uh, uh, good for... For, for us is also, you know, good for another country, and they're gonna retaliate. You know, we saw that with the steel and aluminum tariffs. Uh, a bunch of other uh, countries have said, hey, you guys are, are uh, you know, imposing tariffs on, uh, you know, trumped up grounds, no pun intended. Uh, and, you know, the, you know the, the, the idea that we're a national security threat to you is laughable. And we're gonna, you know, we're gonna uh, retaliate. 
We're going to pick products that hurt you politically, Mr. President. And what countries have done is they've chosen products that, um, in, that matter in states and with constituencies that are politically critical to the White House. And, and that's, that's been the, the general response. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing sort of the same thing that happened with steel and aluminum. Now there's talk about cars and car parts. Um, again, the idea that, that the tariffs would be invoked under the same national security provision. Um, and what I think is interesting is Matt Blunt, who's the former Republican governor of Missouri, he's now the head of the American Automotive Policy Council. He said, quote, every auto manufacturer and parts manufacturer that I am aware of thinks this would be a mistake. So the president's trying to do this because he wants to save the American auto industry or he wants to save jobs in the automotive industry. I mean, but you have these former Republican officials saying things like this. I mean, explain to us what's going on here. Yeah, you know, this is, this is you know, the, the president, again, trying to fulfill a campaign promise. You know, auto workers in the country uh, have been struggling. You know, and uh, I think, by the way, it needs to be acknowledged that, you know, not all Americans have benefited from trade. Um, but the way to address that is not necessarily with tariffs. It's by programs and training and efforts that actually can improve the situation for them. But, you know, on the autos, um, you know, this is, this is something, you know, imposing tariffs uh, on car parts and cars coming into the country, uh, nobody in the auto industry itself wants this. You know, uh, this is something that the auto industry is is you know quietly saying, please, 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 don't do this. And even not so quietly. Yeah, and not so quietly. You know, I mean, so Commerce issued a report to the White House in mid February. Everybody in Washington wants to know what's in this report, including Republican uh, congressmen and senators like the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, uh, Chuck Grassley. You know, everybody wants to see what, what is the case that the Commerce Department is making that car parts coming into the country is a national security risk. But I think what the auto industry is afraid of is, hey, you know, the tariffs is going to ratchet up the costs for them. So you have a tariff, a tariff on an auto part. It goes onto the car. All that's going to do is, is raise the cost of, of the car. Uh, and so consumers lose. The auto industry loses because they're not as competitive as, as other countries. And, uh, it's, it's, uh, and, and auto workers may lose. I mean, you had alluded to GM. Yeah. You know, a GM plant closed today. Uh, and is laying off auto workers. And, and is this something where the president seems to, to view supply chains like the 1950s, right? Like everything is made all in this one place. But what it seems like, and you touched on it, am I right, that the challenge is even if you're an American automaker, you are still getting parts for, your, for the cars that you are making from all over the world. And so that's why those tariffs hurt you, right? because you have a global supply chain. Exactly, I mean, in today's world, you know, like your smartphone in your pocket, it probably comes from dozens and dozens of countries. Um, you know, with NAFTA, you know, car parts probably go, go back and forth across the US-Mexico border, you know, over a dozen times. So that's just the nature of global supply chains. It's not like, you know, okay, there's one country that makes this car part or this car, another country makes an another car part or, or a another type mm -hmm. of car. And everything's it's, made in Michigan, or, yeah, for example. Just, it's just it's not just the case. It's not the way it works. You know, the, the car is, you know, it's a pretty complicated piece of machinery with parts and technology, research and design, engineering coming from all over the world. And when you start putting tariffs on products, you know, in a haphazard way, you're basically causing costs to go up, you know, costs for the companies, costs for the American consumer. On top of that, the Europeans aren't going to sit on their hands. They're going to retaliate, you know. The Germans are going to uh, 
think hard about letting in, you know, uh, uh, the, the big three automakers if, if they can't get their cars mm -hmm. uh, into the American market, mm -hmm. you know? So I want to talk a little bit about China. So we saw some signs of, of possible breakthrough between the U.S. and China. So President Trump, is, as he does all things, he tweeted that he would delay the March 1st deadline to increase tariffs. They were scheduled to go from 10 percent to 25 percent on $200 billion worth of, of Chinese imports. And he said that he felt like there was some progress in the talks, that they may have a breakthrough soon. Give us an update. Where are we in the U.S.-China talks on these uh, related to these tariffs? Yeah, I, I think I would uh, lean on the words of uh, great philosopher Yogi Berra, uh, uh, who said, of course, uh, it's not over until it's over. And uh, I think as we saw with uh, uh, Kim Jong-un uh, in Hanoi last week, uh, until we have a, a deal, nothing's done until everything is done, as Ambassador Lighthizer uh, likes to say. What I think we know for, for uh, pretty sure uh, is that, uh, well, we've seen that uh, the president has not raised uh, tariffs on the $200 billion of Chinese uh, goods that already are at 10% tariffs. He had threatened to raise them up to 25% um, at the start of this month. He hasn't done that. Um, you know, the Wall Street Journal and others are trying to read the tea leaves and, you know, they've said, hey, look, we can expect the Chinese to purchase more um, soybeans and ag products, uh, more meat and poultry, more uh, natural gas and energy supplies. You know, they'll take steps that are cosmetic to reduce the trade deficit, understanding that, you know, they can always wait the president out and revert back to what they've been doing um, you know, a couple years down the road. Um, I, I think the big question is, well, I think there's several big questions. One, can we get an enforceable deal, like a, a no kidding deal where if um, the Chinese don't actually implement it, um, that will result in, you know, certain, you know, punishments, you know, snap back tariffs or you know, something that creates accountability with the Chinese. Uh, because we've seen this movie before where, you know, the, the, the Chinese love meetings, you know, uh, process, meetings, let's dialogue, you know, share best practices <laughs> and talk about, you know, how to get to a win-win outcome. You, we saw They're this interminable. <laughs> yeah, we, we, you and I saw this at Commerce, you yeah. know, and... Um, you know, we, we, China's a hard problem to, to, to be fair. You know, the, the last administration earlier on was focused on engagement. You know, we talked about a reimagined dialogue with mm -hmm. the China focusing on win-wins. So it, it's, it's not easy. Um, and, but you gotta stick with it. You gotta, you know, hold them accountable. Um, you know, and, and that's not easy. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think that that's the first thing. Um, is there going to be enforceability? Any any there there and any deal that gets mm -hmm. gets done? And then, are we going to address these so-called structural issues with the Chinese economy? By that I mean, you know, uh, IP protections. Um, you know, uh, these requirements on transferring technology from American companies if you want to gain access to that 1.4 billion person market. Can you define for us what that means? We hear a lot yeah. about this term, forced technology transfer, and I want to make sure we, we really define that so everybody has a common understanding, because that's, that's really what we're getting at. We're talking about IP protections and technology transfer. Explain to us in practice what that yeah. looks like and what that means. In practice, what it means, and you see it the most with the, with the tech sector, you know, with um, uh, cloud computing, data storage, you know, all of the Silicon Valley firms. It's, if you want access to our huge market, that's going to come with strings attached. You're going to have to share technology with us and so practically that means you can't come in here and operate, you know, on your own. You have to, you need a domestic Chinese partner. 
often the partner is a state-run entity. They want access to you know, crown jewel technology. And then I think the, the administration would say that you know, after that technology is transferred, you might find that the welcome wagon is no longer being rolled out. And it's, thanks, we, we can do this now. I mean, you know, they want to graduate to that next level of development, right? Chinese wages now are about five times higher than, say, wages in India, and higher, even higher than that in other developing parts of Asia. So the idea that you can continue to, you know, move forward on your manufacturing model like you did for the last 20, 30 years, that's not going to work forever. So they got to graduate to the next level. Mm -hmm. And that's competing with the United States. Mm -hmm. So where do you think we land on this? I mean, it seems like there's a couple different deals that we could have that would be the final deal. I mean, there's sort of the, I guess I would say at the top tier deal, which is we get a meaningful deal on structural reform plus agreements to buy things like natural gas, soybeans, beef. Or do we get a little bit, do we land in what I would say is sort of second tier deal, which is they're not going to do the real structural, structural reform on IP, force technology, but they'll say, look, we'll buy X number of soybeans, we'll buy X amount of beef, and let's call it good, and throw in some natural gas, and we've got a deal. So, I mean, where do you think that this ultimately lands? Do we get the structural reform, or is it just, we'll agree to buy some stuff from you, and let's call it a day? The, the growing anxiety in Washington with the president, whether you're talking about trade issues or security issues, is that he's going to just give away the store, uh, that he's going to get duped, he's going to settle for um, a lowercase d deal um, and uh, declare victory and go home. Uh, and I think that is the big uh, worry, I think, in Washington. Now, he has a trade advisor in Bob Lighthizer um, who's doing the day-to-day -day negotiating um, who has true religion on this stuff. I mean, I think Ambassador Lighthizer uh, really wants to get China ch to change the structure of its economy. He wants it to do a better job of protecting IP. You know, no more of these forced technology transfers. He wants to see meaningful market access. The question is, is the Lighthizer camp going to win out or the the, the Mnuchin-led camp, which is focused more on stock market fluctuations and you know what billionaire pals may be grumbling about Mar-a-Lago and you know, I, my my best guess is is still that we're going to get a lowercase D deal. What you described as steps that address the problem as Trump defined it, you know, and we talked about earlier mm -hmm. as trade deficits. So they'll do things on the buy side, more mm -hmm. soybeans, beef, more liquefied nat natural gas from Chenier, you know, uh, maybe more aircraft. Um, but all of these things can be changed. And, you know, it's diverting supply chains. You know, when they were upset at us, they started purchasing soybeans from the Argentinians or Brazil. So you can always divert supply here and there to meet your economic and political needs, but this doesn't change the fundamental dynamic that Lighthizer has been talking about, where China is, is winning at, at the U.S.'s expense. Mm -hmm. and we, we talked about the USMCA last week a lot with Jordan. Um, what should we watch in this space, and where do you think we land? Do you think we ultimately get that ratified, and what are the things that all of us should pay attention to in the next coming months? Yeah, I mean, this, this is going to be the biggest trade issue in, in Congress. And it's going to be a very interesting space to watch from a policy and politics standpoint. You know, you have now a, a House controlled by Democrats. Um, but, but, you know, within the Democratic Party, uh, you know, everybody is trying to win back those, win the Reagan Democrats, right? The ones that voted for President Reagan, may have voted for President Trump, but have historically been part of the Democrats' constituency, right? You know, labor unions, uh, blue-collar uh, workers. 
Um, and so that's going to, those politics are going to play out with NAFTA 2.0. Um, you know, I think at day's end, it's, it's a deal that uh, it brought in environment and labor. Uh, you know, it was negotiated uh, previously through uh, what are called side agreements. It's now in the body of the NAFTA. Um, you know, it, it uh, may increase wages for um, U.S. auto workers because there's requirements in there about, you know, 30% of the output um, has to uh, be come from uh, companies who are paying $16 an hour. I mean, if this isn't like state-led master planning, I don't, I don't know what is, but um, there's, a, there's a rule to that effect that the, the amount uh, has, goes to 45% in 2023. But so there's some changes for the auto industry, environment, labor, um, language on currency manipulation, but by and sh long, long story short, this agreement is minor tweaks uh, to NAFTA, the original NAFTA. Um, what they did is they imported provisions on TPP, uh, this, the trade agreement that uh, President Obama had signed but uh, Trump withdrew from. They took all of the 21st century provisions having to do with IP, uh, data flows, you know, uh, uh, you know, services uh, sectors, and they, they largely imported them into the NAFTA. And then they made, it did some tweaking uh, to auto rule, rules of origin, auto wages. Um, you know, so this, this isn't a much different agreement. I mean, Paul Krugman, some of you may be familiar with the Nobel Prize winning economist who writes for the New York Times. He called this not NAFTA 2.0, he called this NAFTA 0 0.8. Because his, his point is that uh, the, the, the latest iteration of NAFTA is slightly worse than its predecessor when you look at it as a whole. Um, the Democrats, of course, in Congress are, are focused on uh, environment and labor standards and making sure they're strong enough. Uh, also focused on prescription drugs and make, making sure the IP rules in there don't ratchet up the cost of prescription drugs. Uh, the Republicans, you know, I think the pro-free trade Republicans are saying, hey, you know, this is an opportunity to remove those ridiculous steel and aluminum tariffs on Canada and Mexico. You know, neither country is a national security threat. Uh, steel capacity in the U.S. is is above like the, the benchmark levels that were set when the tariffs went into effect. Let's just get, you know, let's make this, let's at least get something good out of this and, and, and junk the steel and aluminum tariffs on our partners and, and neighbors uh, before we even talk about ratifying uh, uh, USMCA. At day's end, I think it's gonna be hard. Uh, the House Ways and Means uh, Chairman uh, Richard Neal said, uh, you know, basically this, this nothing's a given, um, that it's uh, going to take some time. But I think at day's end with this so-called fast track uh, trade promotion authority that President Obama won, which is basically Congress can't go in there and micromanage the language of the agreement. You either vote up or down. Uh, otherwise, nobody would do a trade deal with us if the American Congress could edit every single line of like several hundred page agreements. Um, you know, I, I think with that up or down authority, um, the Republicans, I think, will stick with the president and there will be enough Democrats to get USMCA through. It's not going to be easy. I don't say that with any high degree of confidence. And I think it's going to take longer than a lot of people think it is because there's there's no kind of bipartisan consensus in support of trade, especially as we move into a presidential election year. I mean, our, our presidential election cycle starts now, like two years before Americans vote. And so I think that whole 2020 dynamic is going to be very much in play on trade. Well, let's take some audience questions. Please wait. Uh, Alex has the microphone, so please wait till he gets you uh, to you with the microphone. 
Um, thank you for coming today. Uh, you spoke to an extent about China's development and juxtaposed the U.S. and China. Could you talk a little bit about, if you're comfortable, the Belt Road Initiative and what it might mean for the future of trade? Sure. The, so the, the Belt and Road Initiative is President Xi Jinping's signature uh, initiative, signature project in Asia. So there's a large gap in infrastructure in Asia, you know, in terms of roads, bridges, ports, uh, digital infrastructure to build like smart cities, you know, that are cleaner, more environmentally friendly. You know, and, and as these Asian economies are growing, they're major needs. Um, and so what China has done is it's said, okay, we have a lot of workers here in China. We have uh, oversupply of money, of capital to loan you guys. And uh, we know how to build roads, bridges, airports, ports, you name it very well. And they do. And so they said, okay, we're going to export, you know, this uh, oversupply of workers, of raw materials like steel and cement and so on. And we're going to help, uh, you know, help create, you know, 21st century economies through infrastructure development in Asia. The thing about Belt and Road is it's, it's not clear where BRI starts and where it ends. They've talked about BRI initiatives like uh, in Latin America, in Europe. Um, you know, it, it, I think that the issue uh, that the Trump administration has is that the loans often come with strings attached, uh, so-called debt diplomacy. Uh, the loans are issued by Chinese uh, state-run banks often at, at high interest rates. These are not concessional loans given to poor de developing countries. And so you end up uh, in a situation like Sri Lanka has found themselves, where have, they have this port called Hambun Toda <coughs> that barely gets used uh, or is, is certainly underutilized. Um, but they can't afford to pay back the billions in loans on it. So the Chinese have said, okay, we're just going to buy it then. We're, we're just going to, you know, take it over. And they have a 99-year lease. So it leads to a compromise of country's sovereignty, questions about transparency, because there, there isn't a Foreign Corrupt Practices Act law in China. You know, all American companies can't pay bribes to foreign officials under that law. So issues about transparency, about environmental protection, about labor rights. You know, all our countries, uh, all our uh, uh, companies, they have to adhere by, you know, strict standards in those areas. Um, and so there's a question that, you know, China's getting political leverage uh, by making these economic loans to build these ports, bridges, roads, and so on. And, uh, you know, I think the administration, uh, multiple administrations, ours and the Trump administration, has been struggling to come up with a big economic idea to try to, you know, to, to offer an alternative to Belt and Road. The thing is, a lot of the places where the Chinese are investing, they're not, ne they're not, necessarily bankable projects. These aren't like good economic bet bets. Like if you want to build in, in infrastructure in Baluchistan and Pakistan where there's an insurgency going on, you know, I, I don't see, I, I don't see American companies rushing in to, uh, into Baluchistan or, you know, some of the, some areas of the world um, where the investments are being made. That said, we do need to think harder about how we can provide alternatives so that um, countries that want to grow don't feel like they have to make, they, they have to sign on to these deals because they have no other option. Uh, two, two parts to this. One, one's, I, I think you've been very uh, charitable in your description of uh, President Trump's approach to trade. Um, 
and I'm speaking as a lifelong Republican, so I'll make, make everything clear here. His, his experience as a business person, uh, if, you, if you look at it, and I, I'm, I'm, a, I go, I'm a New Yorker, so I've known him for many, many years. If you look at what he did in New Jersey as an example, and the bankruptcies that he caused, and he walked away because of US laws, but many other businesses were hurt. With that attitude, walking into these deals, with bilateral deals, I'm going to make it work, or I can walk away from it. But when you walk away from it in terms of our country now, the harm that's done is, is almost uh, is going to be long standing. But that's aside. My second, my second area really deals with when we talk about trade and loss of jobs, and I think I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago at one of these sessions, we knew that we were going to be losing jobs, losing manufacturing jobs 50, 60 years ago. I remember in business schools we talked about this transition of jobs. Um, and yet, the biggest problem we have today, and I have spent time in China, I visited many of their new universities that are science, engineering universities. Talk about investment in that area, they've been doing very well in that area. Is there any likelihood that as great as this country is, our country, that we might look at that infrastructure and, and, and invest in it? Right, right now, as I said, Mr. Trump walked away in bankruptcy. Students can't walk away from investing in education if something goes wrong. But is there any possibility on a national level that we might look at investment in education in the sciences, in engineering, and all of that area where we knew the jobs would be in the future? Because I think we've got to get past blaming other countries, blaming other countries for the problems that we have because we didn't prepare for them. So my question is, is it likely? It's a, it's a good question, uh, and it's a, it's a terrific comment. I've never heard um, you know, that kind of analogy made between Trump's real estate deals and uh, you know, declaring bankruptcies um, and his approach to the world and, and to trade in general. Um, you know, it's interesting. I mean, the, the president talks about putting America first, but when the U.S. negotiates trade deals, what I've observed as a, as a trade lawyer and, you know, during our time together in commerce and now as a consultant, you know, I mean, U.S. trade negotiators, they always put America first. Um, they are tough, tough negotiators. A lot of them are, are former uh, uh, trade lawyers around Washington. Um, who've left, um, you know, well-paying law firm private sector jobs to go work and negotiate trade deals that benefit American workers, farmers, ranchers, and companies. Um, you know, the, the, but, you know, trade deals are not like New York real estate deals, you know. Uh, there are real-world consequences when you negotiate bad deals. Um, real-world people suffer. Uh, it has an impact on uh, economies. It has an impact on another country's politics and how they view us. You know, I, you know we, we'll continue to uh, be f uh, friends on military and security issues with Canada, but you can't deny the fact that the way the deal was negotiated, the arm twisting, uh, that, that it left bruised feelings. You know, so it's Trade deals aren't real estate deals, um, and I agree with everything you said. And then, I mean, I think you made a, a very important point on, um, you know, some of the anxiety that the country has about China in particular and the loss of manufacturing jobs. I mean, I think the best China policy uh, would be uh, to invest smartly in education, just as you said, invest in the STEM sciences, retraining workers, um, you know, having uh, legitimate worker assistance programs. You know, there's this program called Technical Adjust Adjustment Assistance, TAA, that's supposed to go to steel workers, blue-collar workers who've seen their jobs migrate uh, overseas. Everybody in Washington agrees that 
you know, TAA is inadequate, but yet you can't pass legislation um, to have a more robust worker assistance and retraining program. Um, you know, healthcare needs to be portable. You know, so if you lose your job, you're not out of luck on health care. You know, but, you know, all of these things are things that we don't need the Chinese or anybody else to do to make us better. Um, and the question you posed is, can we get our house in order? And um, I'm concerned. I had lunch yesterday with a former ambassador with uh, 30, 35 years of experience and we were talking and you know he said I'm gonna go away to my retirement home pretty soon <laughs> you guys are gonna be left dealing with this problem and um, you know I, I think to to really tackle it we need more people coming to Washington less partisanship you know and we need to fix what's a broken political system our politics is broken um, you know, when that's whether you're a Democrat or a Republican. You said you're a lifelong Republican. I'm a lifelong Democrat, and I strongly associate myself with everything you said. Um, so it's not necessarily about party. It's, you know, it's about, you know, trying to come together around a national agenda um, that works. We're spending too much time in, in Washington demonizing China, in my view. I mean, don't get me wrong, I think China has done a number of things wrong, and I think uh, the current government in China is assertive in a way that prior ones have not been. But if we spent some of the energy that we do, uh, you know, uh, worrying about China on fixing our own house, you know, there's, there's no problem that I think if we, if we had the political will, which is what you're talking about, that we wouldn't be able to, to tackle. Howdy, so I, just to jump straight into my question, I was hoping you could expand on the current state of our soft power in the United States and how it compares to five years ago and if you think the losses or gains will influence the next administration and how that administration will have to confront it. Talk about what soft power is first. Yeah. It's, it, it's this idea that was put out by a, a Harvard University professor that um, in international politics and relations, the way to influence people is not always through your economic might or through the barrel of a gun. It's the idea that ideas m matter, that your values, your ability to persuade someone rather than to coerce them um, is, is also important and shouldn't be diminished. Um, you know, I mean, you look at the polling data and, uh, you know, the polling data objectively says that the world's view of, uh, the, of the government in Washington, uh, is not high. Um, you know, the way we negotiate trade deals, you know, um, it's largely seen as bullying. Um, uh, you know, the, the way we talk about issues, our discourse, you know, it's rude, it's coarse, you know, it's, you know, you wouldn't want your son to talk like a number of our politicians or your daughter to talk like a number of our politicians do. It's, uh, it's it leaves a lot to be desired. And I think um, other countries see that and where they used to see us as an exemplar, you know, our, uh, during our best moments, you know, this, the shining city on the hill, um, I think um, a number of countries, our allies in Europe, our friends in North America, allies in Asia are saying, where is that, that generosity of spirit? Where is that can-do leadership? You know, it's, it's been replaced by this, this vision of American carnage uh, that Trump referred to in his inauguration. And, um, I think a lot of countries and the leaders in a lot of countries think that's, that's, that's not the America they know. I think the good news is a lot of our soft power comes from American people. Um, and 
you know, our bonds as a country, the, how active our civil society is, our press, you know, institutions like this one, universities like KU, you know, and I think all of that is, you know, something that, that you know, contributes to our soft power. And people around the world aren't conflating the American leadership with the American people. Now, if this goes on for, you know, two more years, six more years, I think the story may be a different one. I have two questions. Um, well, I guess the first one is, do you, think the, do you think that China, or do you subscribe to the idea that China is not trying to dip, uh, trap people with the Belt and Road Initiative, but rather expand its soft power and like economic markets that could eventually, like, you know, in a long-term sense, like expand its economy into? Yeah, I think there is a clear soft power element to Belt and Road. Um, you know, we've been making the argument recently, pointing out all the downsides of Belt and Road that I talked about. You know, debt, so-called debt trap, diplomacy, environmental and labor costs, um, you know, concerns about transparency, um, you know, uh, economic leverage leading to political coercion. You know, but I'm not sure everyone sees it that way. Certainly Asian countries don't see it that way. And on some level, everybody has to be able to figure out what their best interests are, right? And so I think some countries are saying, hey, these are, these are the options at our disposal. The World Bank or uh, Western lenders aren't going to give us loans for these projects. They see, see them as risky. You know, the Chinese are. And we're going to make a, make a bet. Uh, we're going to bet on ourselves and our economy. And we, we think we'll be OK. So I, definitely, there's a soft power element to this. And I think uh, countries like China have tried to fill this vacuum um, you know, that has been created you know, with America retreating or being seen by some countries as retreating a sense that we're retrenching, we're turning inward as a country. Uh, you know, sometimes we're turning on each, on each other. Um, you know, I think uh, our competitors, uh, our adversaries, uh, you know, see an opportunity there. You know, nature abhors a vacuum. And that's, I think, certainly the case, case in international politics. Uh, yeah, uh, I know with the recent uh, renegotiation of NAFTA or NAFTA point eight or USMCA, uh, there's been a lot of focus on our uh, dairy production here and a lot of uh, protectionist policies in Canada that prevented uh, uh, dairy from the United States being sent into Canada. Uh, now that, that we've essentially, or once we have uh, opened up those markets up into uh, Canada, I want to ask about uh, our practice here and subsidizing dairy production, and then the way essentially Canada supports their dairy production is through protectionist trade policies like we are currently in effect and we're possibly could be expanding uh, into. Um, do you think since we are going to then be sending more dairy into Canada, do you think we're going to be, uh, uh, our practice of subsidizing that is going to be more contentious with the Canadian government? Is it going to be something we're going to be hearing a whole lot more about? And is it something that uh, could cause more problems with our relationship with Canada? Look, on, on trade, every, everybody puts, puts their own country's you know, economic interests first, right? And, um, you know, so the, the Canadians have had this uh, dairy scheme, a managed uh, pricing scheme uh, that's created, you know, a, a lot of angst for American dairy farmers over the years. And uh, the president was able to get some changes from the Canadian government as part of renegotiating NAFTA. And, you know, there's some types of uh, dairy products, you know, like da certain dairy powders and, um, you know, are, are going to be, the trade is going to be more free. I mean, I think the Canadians, as you said, would point to, you know, the way that um, the U.S. government has a hand sometimes in um, some sectors. I mean, the one that comes to, 
mind the most is the sugar industry, uh, which is heavily managed here. Um, but, you know, trade deals are, are about horse trading, and you're not going to get to a perfect outcome. But you got to, you know, you got to compromise, be willing to compromise. You know, you got to, uh, you know, you, you make the best arguments possible. You try to arrive at the best deal you can. But, um, you know, there's no such thing as 100% like free trade anywhere. We are a pretty open economy. Um, you know, and the president is questioning whether that bargain has, has served us well. He thinks other countries have taken advantage of us. Um, I think a lot of others would, have, would argue that our economy has done so well post-World War II because we've been largely open, because we've been an environment that fosters innovation. Um, but yeah, we're, you know, the C Canadians and others are obviously going to point out the ways in which we aren't living up to that I trade ideal. I feel like I'd be a little bit amiss uh, to not take the discussion a tiny bit off track, um, given your expertise on foreign policy and your time staffing the Foreign Relations Committee, um, to ask you about the India-Pakistan uh, escalation. Um, given your experience and focus on that region, uh, what do you think uh, this recent escalation has had um, on the dynamic in the region? And has it fundamentally altered uh, the relationships and uh, factors in play right now? Well, in, in South Asia, you have uh, two nuclear armed neighbors um, who have been fighting wars, uh, four of them, um, and have had various security incidents uh, spanning a number of years. India has been the victim of ter terrorism coming from Pakistan uh, for, for many years now, an attack on the, their parliament in the early 2000s, a coordinated, a coordinated massive terrorist attack uh, in, in uh, uh, Bombay uh, in 2008, um, you know, attacks in 2016 in Kashmir, and then the most recent, uh, very large, scale terrorist attack in the disputed uh, territory of Kashmir. Both India and Pakistan have parts of Kashmir. Uh, both think they should have all of it. Um, but uh, Pakistan sees the use of terrorists, at least it has in the past, as a legitimate uh, strategy to advance its interests. And so that was the, the fuse that lit the latest confrontation. Uh, a well-known terrorist group, uh, uh, Jayashi Mohammed, uh, based in Pakistan, uh, whose leaders are known to the uh, Pakistan uh, military and intelligence officials, uh, launched a big attack uh, in Indian-held Kashmir. Uh, it's a ele election season in India. The Indians are going to vote on a new prime minister a vote on a new parliament that will result in a new prime minister uh, in a few months. And, um, you know, uh, Prime Minister Modi uh, took decisive action. The problem is, you know, what I said in the trade context also applies in the security context. When you start taking escalatory and confrontational steps, it's hard politically to de-escalate sometimes. Nobody wants to look like they are the one making the humiliating climb down. You have a new leader in Pakistan who uh, has to deal with heavy influence from the military, uh, given the country's history with, with coups. And then you have the Indians going to the poll, polls. And it looks like the situation has d diffused with, uh, diffused with uh, the pilot being returned. Uh, this is the Indian pilot who was shot down. Um, by the Pakistanis. Pakistanis returned them, but you know, it's, uh, it's a larger problem and, and uh, Pakistan must do more to deal with uh, the terrorist threat. The one point I'd quickly make about the U.S. role is during past crises in 2002 and in, uh, oh, in 1998, 99, 
There was a very significant behind the scenes US role in calming the situation down. And uh, query whether this administration was able to exert that kind of leadership given the positions it's taken um, and given the, the leadership capital it can spend around the world. I, I just don't know if it did or not. Probably got time for two more, so this will be our next to last one, then we'll do one more. Okay. Um, so in the US, most of the international business are done by small and medium-sized business. And uh, so what would be your advice to uh, a small, medium-sized company how do they deal with this ever-changing international business landscape? It's, it's a good question, and uh, I think uh, it's very challenging for businesses. I mean, one of the underrated aspects uh, of uh, all of the trade, uh, you know, disruption um, is that it creates uncertainty and unpredictability for businesses. And that really has a chilling effect on businesses. When you don't know what your costs are going to be, where, you're going to, where something is going to be supplied from, um, you don't know what the rules of the game are with, with major uh, suppliers, um, you're more likely to stand pat. You know, you're less likely to invest. Um, you're less likely to hire. Uh, in that kind of an environment. And uh, it's a very tough environment for small and medium-sized businesses who want to be involved in global activities. And, um, you know, so I think trying to take advantage of the resources that the U.S. government uh, makes available, you know, there's uh, U.S. export assistance centers all over the country. Um, you know, uh, and, uh, and uh, I think, uh, you know, try to mobilize as a group, uh, you know, in district export councils uh, with local uh, Congress people, with uh, local political representatives, and really make sure everyone understands um, how the, these trade policies are, are hurting small and medium-sized businesses that are trying to get global. The Export Assistant Councils is, is an important point. There's actually one in Kansas City, and those are part of the Department of Commerce that Ottman and I worked, about, worked at, and the idea behind them is they are for companies that are s small, so they don't have the ability to have all the expertise under their roof, that they can go to these export assistance centers to try to get help with some of the technical challenges and other regulatory challenges about exporting. So I know that there is one in Kansas City. It's probably a Band-Aid solution, but it is an important point to touch on. And then we'll do one final question. <laughs> Anybody or else we'll just wrap it up? Oh, one more. How do you view uh, uh, like robots uh, automation on uh, oh, the way uh, the way it's changed uh, the trade talk. No, it's it's. How do you how how does automation, robotics, and artificial intelligence? How does that play into some of these discussions that we're having about trade and the future of trade? It's it's a really great question, and and I'm glad you raised it because we haven't talked about the role of technology um, in, in in the broader trade conversation. You know, I think economists generally agree that a lot of the job losses that have been caused by global trade going back and forth, you know, well, the job losses, some of them have to do with global trade. A lot of it has to do with technology, the changes in technology. Um, you know, we now use computers and algorithms to rely on what we used to have people do. And um, I think there's no doubt that uh, technology is going to continue to have a disruptive impact. I think it could be an order of magnitude more significant 
as you talk about artificial intelligence and um, the Internet of Things and autonomous vehicles and, you know, is, uh, is the, uh, are long haul truckers going to be replaced by driverless 18 wheelers? You know, and um, it's hard to say, you know, how this is all going to, to play. And you see thoughtful people um, taking different views. There's going to be winners, you know, uh, from the technology evolution with artificial intelligence and robots. And, you know, you're going to have, you're going to need uh, workers who can um, work the computers and do the things you need robots to do to build things, you know. Um, so it, it's going to take from certain kinds of jobs and it'll create new kinds of jobs. But the, the thing that's so important, and we talk, touched on it earlier, is you got to have people trained for those kind of jobs. You can't have people who are trained to do 20th century jobs. And, you know, I think vocational schools, apprentice programs, you know, um, we, our schools got to prepare um, our workforce for the 21st century to, to, to tackle the technology problem you're, you're talking about. And I have, I have two kids, seven and nine, first and third grade. And the way my, my son's school, uh, the oldest, teaches is we don't even know what the job market is going to be like in, you know, when, when my son, 15 years from now, is ready to uh, get his first job, you know. And so it's, we're going to try to build skills that are broadly applicable, regardless of whether robots are running amok or what's happening in the world, you know, uh, skills of how to work with people, uh, how to work in teams. Um, you know, critical thinking, uh, problem solving, uh, high emotional intelligence. You know, the, it's, it's, I'm struck by how different, you know, the, the education is from when you and I were in, were in schools, you know, and it's, it's, it's trying to deal with that uncertainty. We don't know what it's going to look like in all honesty. Anybody that tells you that they do, I, I'm not sure I would put a lot of stock in that. Well, I want to thank Amman for a wonderful discussion. A reminder that we'll be on spring break next week. For the students, I hope you enjoy your spring break. And we'll be back on the 20th for a really interesting discussion with Mike Matson from the Kansas Farm Bureau. And we're going to talk about how trade affects us right here in Kansas. So can we give a round of applause to Amman? <laughs> <laughs>